Contemporary social and political theory is aware that our world is confronted by a number of serious challenges. Pluralism and diversity, there's the, the many different cultures trying to live together in the same place. The challenges of globalization, the expansion of the capitalist market and all the consumerism that follows. Ma these are causing massive social and political problems in most societies in the world. The question that confronts theorists and theologians is how do we respond to these challenges? How do we build cohesive societies in the face of diversity? How do we make moral decisions when the people we live amongst ha have so many different assumptions and traditions they draw from? And for religious adherence, these are concerns about the societies we live in, but also these same tensions come into our religious communities, in our churches, in our mosques, our synagogues, where we encounter diversity and the influences of all these larger forces coming into play in our daily lives. And for theologians, the question also comes, how does theology speak to modern, globalized, pluralistic, secular societies when so many people not only do not belong to the Christian tradition, but may not even be very familiar with it at all. For people wrestling with these questions, the work of Jürgen Habermas, a German philosopher and social theorist, promises to be a very helpful resource. Habermas is known for his very staunch defense of concepts like rationality, universality, freedom and equality and humanism. He defends the Enlightenment traditions against its many critics while acknowledging that these traditions need to be refined and improved and adapted to our modern times. His main concern is this. When a community finds that its decision-making processes have become controversial and divisive, whether that's over morality, over how to make changes to a local community and so on, how do people in that situation come to some form of agreement? or whether they can. And it's his conviction that coming to consensus is actually possible in the midst of diversity. So the way is to how to resolve these debates. And for him, he's reassured that it's possible to do this with the only force that we are confronted with is the force of a better argument. So in this presentation, I'm going to briefly introduce Jürgen Habermas and his influences. I'll talk about his main theoretical commitments, his framework, and some of the criticisms that he's been uh, leveled at, him, at his work. I'll talk about his concept of religion and how theologians have responded to his work. And finally, I'll s s talk a little bit about how in Habermas's more recent work, his attitude towards religion and through theology has gone through a process of considerable change. He's much more appreciative of these traditions. And so it'd be interesting for us to think about why that is. Jürgen Habermas was born in Dusseldorf, Germany in 1929. Being someone of that age, of course, that meant that the Second World War was a large part of his early life. And at the age of 15, in 1944, he was recruited into the Hitler Youth, as most young boys would have been. That meant that he was soon assigned to the air defenses of Western uh, Europe in the Western Wall. And people of his generation are known as the Flak Helfer Generation in Germany. So the generation of who had, were called upon to defend Germany at the end of the war when defeat was obvious. Habermas has written about, about his life what really determined my political thinking was 1945. Now, what he means by that is it gave him a unique perspective on the German Federal Republic, so what we now know as Western Germany, because the new order was so superior to what he had known as a young boy that he valued it for the rest of his life. But as he grew into maturity, he was aware at how controversial and imperfect 
the Western German liberal democratic system was. But he made his life work to defend that system because it was so clear to him that it was better than what he had known under National Socialism. But after the war, as Habermas uh, returned to more normal life and began to his process of education and thinking about his future, he very quickly became disturbed by the fact that, in his view, Germany was not really addressing or facing up to its Nazi past. For example, when as an undergraduate, he was horrified to discover that his favorite philosopher at the time, Martin Heidegger, had been a member of the Nazi party and indeed had written articles in defense of Hitler. And he only discovered this because in 1953, Heidegger republished these uh, lectures without changing anything or without putting in footnotes apologizing or admitting that he had made some mistakes. And so for Habermas, why was this the first time I heard about this? And why isn't anyone criticizing these lectures? And then at the University of Bonn, while he was doing his doctorate, Habermas discovered that his two doctoral supervisors had been sympathetic with the Nazis. So again, we aren't confronting these problems in Germany, was his concern. And so he, again, was motivated to make it his life's work to counter what he understood to be the problems of the Nazi past. For Habermas, again, what made his disgust at, these, at the legacy and the silence about the Nazi past so disturbing? It was simply his recognition that the Bonn Republic, or the West German Liberal Democratic Society, was so superior to what had come before. It held the promise of a very much better Germany, and he also believed a better Europe. And so his goal was to redeem the potential of the German democratic system against all its challenges and limitations, to help it achieve what he calls, and this is a, a Habermasian way of saying it, its validity claim. The liberal democracy said it can achieve something better for humanity. And so Habermas thought he wanted to help the, this system, this democratic democracy, live up to its potential. So as Habermas began looking for resources and influences to help him with his defense of German liberal democracy, he was drawn as a young man to the thought of Karl Marx, to Immanuel Kant and Hegel. But some of his chief early influences were the scholars gathered, gathered around the Frankfurt School, or more formally, the Institute for Social Research at the University of Frankfurt, led by Max Horkheimer and Theodor Adorno. For some time, Habermas was the teaching assistant for Adorno. And he drew from them uh, one of their key ideas at the time, which Adorno and Horkheimer borrowed from the sociologist Max Weber, which was the concept of instrumental reason. The idea that modern thought, modern rationality, has become increasingly focused on influencing and controlling nature, trying to make things control our environment and so forth. So technical thinking. Now for Weber and for Adorno and Horkheimer and, and, and with them Habermas, this wasn't essentially a problem. It's obviously a good thing that we can influence nature. The problem was that this was becoming the only form of reasoning that was valued. Moreover, in the face of these systems that technical reason was creating, bureaucracy, government laws, it was becoming increasingly difficult, said Weber and those who followed him, of arguing for anything else, aesthetic beauty, moral goods and so on, unless they obeyed the, the, the demands of technical reason. So bureaucracy was starting to control human societies, or as Max Weber put it, we find ourselves in an iron cage. We can't do what we want to do because we've got so much red tape in our way. The systems are starting to control us. We're not getting freer through rationality. We're becoming more controlled. Habermas began to think 
that his teachers, Adorno and Horkheimer, overemphasized the domination of instrumental rationality in, modern, in the modern world. He didn't say it didn't exist, but it, they overemphasized it. They missed other forms of reason that were available. So he described rationality as having three components to it. The first was indeed technical reason, or purposive reasoning as he calls it, the cognitive making things. But there were two other forms of reasoning available. The second is being emphatic, or purposive reason largely to do with morality. How should we live together? Which way should I behave? It's not just about control, it's about what makes for a better relationship and a better world. And the third was expressive or aesthetic reasoning, such as you find in art and poetry. It's not simply emotion, it's obviously artists think carefully about how to put things together. Poets wrestle with how language to express themselves. It's a way of thinking that's valuable and resource. And so Habermas, Mas's position was, yes, we have this problem of this iron cage and bureaucracy, but if we reinvigorate emphatic reason and aesthetic reason, well, then it can be counterbalanced more effectively in modern societies. And so this becomes his project that he takes for his own. Habermas marks this independence, this new project from his teachers in a book from 1962, the, trans the Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere. In that book, he makes a clean break with a negative view of the Enlightenment, that modern rationality is just becoming controlling and dominating freedom. He emphasizes that the public sphere, so the, the society outside of the systematic bureaucratic regime, so outside of the government, outside of institutions, but the public sphere of citizens coming together to talk with each other can counterbalance authoritarian governments and bureaucratic systems. So a vibrant public sphere can help advance freedom and keep a check on domination. And so his book was a defense of liberal society. Having marked his distinctive perspective from his teachers, the rest of Habermas's career is essentially exploring what are the foundations that will enable this project to be successful? How precisely do, should we understand this in, emphatic concept of reason, this moral sense of practical reasoning? And once we get a sense of that, how can we help the public sphere citizens in liberal democracies make sure that their societies are becoming more free and supportive of emphatic reasoning as opposed to just becoming reduced to technical reason and bureaucracy. The way Habermas decided that a t greater attention to purposive moral rationality could be developed was by turning to language. And he, one of his slogans becomes that modern thinking had become too dependent on what he calls the philosophy of consciousness or the philosophy of the subject, which was that the way you reason, the way you think, is largely according to logic and consistency inside your own head. So we're arguing theoretically and abstractly. But of course, as, no. Habermas values logic and so on, but of course the problem is it's only the individual thinking inside herself or himself. And so that becomes a society and a culture based on experts, the people with the most knowledge. And also such ways of thinking aren't interrupted by the opinions and ideas of other people frequently enough. So Habermas called for what he, called, what he labeled a linguistic turn a turn to communicative rationality or intersubjective discussion where what is thought to be reasonable and academic is communication between different people as opposed to the independent thinker. So Habermas turned to new influences for him, largely from the Anglo-American tradition in the philosophy of language, Ludwig Wittgenstein, John Cyril, George Herbert Mead, and also to American pragmatism 
John Dewey, C.S. Pierce, to try to help him understand better how human beings interact and how language is such a key part of that. Having absorbed all of this literature, Habermas set out his own theory, which he called in the first instance a universal pragmatics. Now that sounds all very abstract, so I'll try to explain what he means. The basic question he's trying to answer with this theory is, is consensus between people possible, given how different we are? Now his answer, of course, is yes. But he was writing in an environment where many people had started to doubt this was at all uh, realistic, that we could come to some kind of agreement with all our radical differences. We're just going to start you know, competing with each other, um, reasserting our own preferences, and in the end, those with power will simply be the winners. Uh, it has nothing to do with rationality. Habermas said, no, not if we understand and live according to the structures of communicative rationality. If we pay attention to language and how it works, we have the possibility of consensus. And so he draws from these thinkers I've just mentioned from, for speech act theory. How is it that we speak to each other? And then he asks us to recognize what do we assume when we speak to each other? So he says something like, so for example, he says, Notice that when we speak to each other, we assume four things. The first is that you can understand me. So there's a communic we assume uh, intelligibility. We can actually understand each other if we listen. The second is we assume that there's such thing as a truth. I don't tell you something unless I think it's true. So there's an assumption that actually we do have true convictions available to us. The third thing is truthfulness. In other words, normally people will try to speak to you accurately and clearly. He's not unaware that people can lie, but he says normally if we're going to start talking to each other, that sort of suggests we think we can learn something from someone. They're going to be honest with us. And finally, a claim of appropriateness. We're all very aware in communication that sometimes it's not appropriate to say certain things. Or, I'm aware that someone that I'm speaking to may not, oh, for example, have a university degree, so I will change the language I use. Or, you know, if I'm, I'm a Canadian, you hear from my accent, when I live in Britain as I do, I might start, I will call something a rubbish bin instead of a garbage can. You adapt to context. People do this in language all the time, Habermas says. When you notice that, when you notice these four things about the, tr about the structures of language and how people use it, he says, every time we speak, we presume that there's the potential that we can be understood and that we can agree, even if we're different. Again, that's that adaptability to context. We presume this in our daily lives. We just don't notice it. It's all very subtle, but Habermas says, See, even what in a cynical society, when we don't think we can understand each other, we don't think it's, impo it's possible to understand people who are very different, we can never agree. He says, just know, when we speak, we, we assume that we can. And so his project becomes, let's try to maximize the potential of language to achieve what it can uh, achieve. Let's not be cynical because we don't experience that every day in our daily lives. Sentences presume that we want to be understood, believed, respected, and that we want to understand the person we're talking with. And because of all these things, he can see that sentences have a performative dimension, he says. So, for example, I promise we will go to the zoo tomorrow. That already implies a relationship with someone. It implies a commitment from me, and it, it's a forward-looking vision of our relationship. That's not technical rationality, in other words. It's not, you know, I'm going to, how do I get you to go to the zoo tomorrow, or what will it take, how do, how, what, what, uh, what metro will I take, or will, what, what route will I drive in my car, how much money it will cost. It's a relational vision that's, in, that's contained in the way we think in language. It's about human relationships, so 
how do we appreciate this potential and maximize it, make it, make it uh, more uh, readily available to us in our diverse societies?